Recording one, two, three. Hi, welcome to another episode of Rights for Women. Recording one, two, three. Hi, welcome to another episode of Rights for Women. My guest on the Convo Couch today is Anne Shin. Raised on a farm in British Columbia, Anne lives in Toronto with her partner and two daughters. Aside from cooking and taking walks, she spends her time writing fiction and producing films and series. Her documentary, My Enemy, My Brother, was shortlisted for a 2016 Academy Award and nominated for an Emmy. Her previous documentary, The Defector, Escape from North Korea, won seven awards, including Best Documentary and Best Documentary Director at the 2014 Canadian Screen Academy Awards, an SXSW Interactive Award and a Canadian Digi Award. Hi, welcome to another episode of Rights for Women. Today's episode is a combined Heart of Writing and New Release episode, and my guest on the Convo Couch is Anne Shin. Anne lives in Toronto with two daughters and her partner, and she's a documentary and filmmaker, as well as an author. Her documentary, My Enemy, My Brother, was shortlisted for a 2016 Academy Award and nominated for an Emmy. Her previous documentary, The Defector, Escape from North Korea, won multiple awards for Best Documentary and Best Documentary Director, and became the basis for uh, her book, The Last Exile, or perhaps the other way around. I'm going to talk to Anne about that. I've recently just uh, watched the film. It's, it's a hard in your mouth uh, style documentary in which Anne takes an active part. And I'm currently reading The Last Exile. And it's just so wonderful to read a book um, and to follow a story about people in a part of the world that I really know nothing about. So I'm really looking forward to talking to Anne today about how she wrote The Last Exile. Uh, it's, a, it's a portrait of a young couple in North Korea and their fight for love and freedom. And it's, it's a really vivid, moving, heartbreaking story. So beautifully written. So it's my pleasure to welcome Anne to the Convo Couch today and to find out what's at the heart of her writing. So Anne, welcome to the Rights for Women Convo Couch. It's great to have you um. here. Happy to be sitting on your virtual couch, actually. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, we do have the virtual couch happening. Um, congratulations on The Last Exile. I was just talking to you about it before we started recording, and uh, I can't wait to find out more about it and the documentary, you know, the documentaries you've made and all of your creative work. But before we start that, because we are, you know, mainly talking writing, uh, how did you come to be a writer? I was always writing as a kid and I remember I would write poetry. I remember seeing a book of children's poetry from around the world when I was eight, eight or nine years old. And uh, it inspired me to write poetry as well. And then my dad sent one of my poems off to the little community paper. We lived in a small town called Langley in British Columbia. I mean, you were mentioning you come skiing in Canada sometimes mm. and people might've heard of Whistler. Uh, yes. So we were like 50 minutes from Whistler and um, it was a small town. And when my uh, poem got published in the paper and my dad showed it to me, I was so chuffed. I was like, oh, wow. You know, I thought, wow. So it's not just something that I just do on the side, but it could be something that my dad likes and other people might want to read. So that, uh, that got me thinking more and more about writing. And I think also it's always been like, my first impulse when it comes to needing to express myself or confide in something, it would always be a journal. Mm. Yeah, journal writing is such a great way, isn't it, for you to process your thoughts and, you know, just get them all down on paper. Mm -hmm. um, you're also a documentary maker and, mm -hmm. um, you know, we've been chatting by email and I assumed that the documentaries were the first thing that you made, but they actually came out of the writing of The Last Exile. Is that correct? Yes. So I started researching for The Last Exiles by meeting North Korean defectors, and that eventually took me all the way to the border of North Korea 
and China. And I ended up going on a journey embedded with North Korean defectors escaping from their country. But um, in the process of doing all that research, not only was I amassing more information for my book, but I realized these people with their true stories, there should be a documentary about them. And so I filmed their journey and that also became a documentary. And as is the pace with film and novels, the film mm -hmm. came out first. It's called The Defector, Escape from North Korea. And then my novel came out many years later. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy it's just been launched in Australia. I'm so excited to talk to you about that. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait to get into that. So so you come from a, a Korean background yourself, Anne? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I was born in Canada, but my parents are of Korean background and you know the North the, the, the Korean War really affected our family it's the war that separated Korea into North and South before that war it was all one country and uh, but that war has divided many families and it certainly affected mine as well mm, mm. yeah I was saying to you earlier it's uh, really fascinating to read the book and to watch the documentary and to have your mind open, or my mind opened up to a part of the world that really I know very little about. And I think, you know, it's, it's, I think from memory, from what we did, the little bit we learned in history about the Korean War, I think it was known as the Forgotten War. Um, he, well, that's, yeah. that's the way that it was yeah. sort of known here anyway. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it is a part of the country that, and, and especially, I guess, since the partition and North Korea, you know, becoming com communist and under the rule of, of a dictator is it's a part of the world that is quite kind of shut off isn't it that we really don't know that much about it is I mean they don't call it the hermit kingdom for no reason I mean mm. it's 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 really shut off from the outside world and so people inside the country don't get outside news or outside media their worldview and their understanding of world history is only through what's told to them by the state and then for us on the outside, we don't get much information about what goes on within North Korea, aside from what's sanctioned by the state as, you know, media releases that they release to the world, along with the odd rocket or two. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. So, so you were saying that, you know, you had this, this impulse to write a story set in Korea. Where did the, uh, you know, obviously you've got that cultural background happening and, and I imagine that there would have been a natural curiosity around, mm. you know, exploring that, but where did the inspiration for the book itself come from and, and that, you know, motivation to think, okay, I'm going to actually write a novel set there and about this issue? Uh, it came to me with an image. I don't know, other for, for different writers, the book mm. starts with, with a different kernel for each person. For me, it was an image of one of my main characters, Jin, who's walking along a country road. He's a bit injured, and he's trying to find his way to the border of North Korea. He's trying to escape. And for me, I could just see the expanse of fields beside him on either side of the roads, and this forlorn feeling of trying to get somewhere not knowing where you're going and that image for me was about the search for freedom and that's really the the impulse that started for me with this book um, it was in that image and that that sense of this individual's going to embark on an, a radical uh, a radical escape to freedom and there'll be lots of challenges on the way and moral dilemmas and that is the journey that I wanted to go on with him. And I hope that the readers enjoy going on because we're all talking about living our lives to our fullest potentials or trying to be making free choices in our everyday lives. And I think that, you know, with novels like this, you can display the journey with heightened stakes to kind of underline one, how we are privileged and everything that we should be grateful for in our lives, but two, also to make us see like those little decisions that we're making in our lives uh, or that we might not even know we're making that we're just kind of closing our eyes and, you know, following along uh, as, as we do mm. that 
these all have consequences. And so that's one of the things that I hope people really take away from this novel as well. Mm. Yeah, fantastic. And interesting you mentioned there, you know, the, the fact that fiction does have these heightened stakes, stakes, doesn't it? You know, it's yes, it might not be the exact story that you'd find perhaps in real life, but the essence of it and, and you, as you say, the, the truths that are in there. Um, mm-hmm. I think that's that's the beauty of fiction, isn't it? That we can be drawn into the story and and enjoy actually being part of the story, but at the same time, these other really important issues can be explored. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for instance, I mean, there is one really heartbreaking moment in the book where um, Jin and Hyuk is escaping from prison with their friend Bay. So it's the three of them. But they're in a position where Bay gets there, they jump into a dump truck and Bay gets buried by the debris. And they're trying to find him and dig him out, but they're coming up to a checkpoint. So Hyuk and Jin are exposed on top of the debris. When they do the checkpoint, they're going to be discovered, but Bay is buried, right? So he won't be. But the dilemma that they face is do they jump and, you know, and escape from? the checkpoint or do they stay and try to dig bay out and all three Mm -hmm. of them you know face the guards and some consequences together and so it's it's a dilemma with real heightened stakes but it's 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 one that really we can all relate to like when you're torn between two different two different ends two different aims and you you know it's a matter of choosing between you or your friend like you don't ever want to be in that position but it's that it's that moment and that kind of decision that uh Jin faces and you know with him we as readers go along and 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 go through that too and consider Mm -hmm. you know how would you choose in that situation yeah yeah well having recently watched very recently watch the documentary The Defector that you made and and I want to talk about the relationship between the novel and and the filmmaking because I know that you said you started writing the book and then you realised you wanted to make the documentary out of that. But what struck me as I was watching it was the the real life stakes that these people who are escaping, um, Mm -hmm. they're actually escaping from China and they've already already defected from um, North Korea to China. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the, you know, my heart was in my mouth watching it. The, the courage that these people have and the real dangers that they actually have to go through to get to, you know, those to get through the checkpoints and to get to the, that destination where they can actually then apply for refugee status. So can you talk a little bit about um, the film and what drove you to make the film as, I guess, part of the research for writing the book? Sure. So. With the film, I was embedded with some defectors. There were four women and a couple men and a guide who's called a broker, who's in essence, a human smuggler who ferries these people across borders and through countries for a fee. So he's not trafficking them. He's not selling them off, but he's Mm. smuggling them illegally and charging for his services. and I was with them. We were having to travel uh, undercover in China because North Korean defectors have no status in China because of diff- diplomatic relations between China and Korea, North Korea. Uh, China is bound to report and deport any North Koreans they find on their territory. And when the North Koreans are def- returned to their own country, they face imprisonment and prison camps, uh, torture, possibly execution. And so the stakes are very high for Mm. North Korean defectors. And they're often very high for refugees of all, of all, from all different countries. But with these North Koreans, I was embedded with them. So I had to travel with them on public buses or in trains. And we were instructed by our guide that his name was Dragon. Mm. Um, And he helped, like he told us, you know, not to speak so that we wouldn't reveal that we're foreigners so that the officials wouldn't come to check our ID. The North Koreans had no ID. We were staying in safe houses, eating bowls of noodle soup. You know, we were 
traveling surreptitiously across the country. And it really helped me get a very visceral sense of what they go through. And also to, to have to establish these really strong friendships with people I, you know, in, in, in these extreme circumstances. And like you, I was amazed at their bravery. And I just kept saying to them, like, I'm just so, I'm so uh, impressed by your courage. And they said, I'm not particularly brave or courageous. I'm just doing this because I have to. Mm. And that actually opened my eyes to have a bit of, of a better understanding of how desperate they are. They're so desperate that to take undertake all that risk is not seen as an act of courage, but just an act, a necessary thing that they have to do. So that was also illuminating for me. It must have been. I mean, it was dangerous for you too. I imagine going through that process. How did you, you know, feel during that the filming of the documentary? Uh, it was really nerve wracking, especially one at one leg of the trip where Dragon, the smuggler said, the broker said he wouldn't be traveling with us, that we would have to travel on our own. And so Dragon was this kind of guy who wore like those slick football suits, you know, the, the shiny yeah. zip up jackets and, and he had tattoos and then he had um, three cell phones now. I don't know if you trust anyone with more than one yeah. cell phone, but I had hitched my wagon to this fellow who has three. And then he said in the middle of the trip, you're going to go it alone. And, and so we were all really concerned that he wasn't going to travel this leg of the trip. So there were times like that. Luckily, we got through fine. He really knew his stuff. So, you know, he, he made sure that we were okay. Mm. But there were many times where I felt uh, really nervous. There was one time where I had arranged to meet with the defectors at a certain meeting point in Southeast Asia, because they could go, once they were out of China, once they got through to a country like Thailand, they could finally apply for refugee status at, in, Tha in a country like Thailand. So we arranged to meet in a certain area and they, I arrived there, they didn't show up all day. I was waiting for the next day, they didn't show up. And I was very, very, distraught, worried that they were caught inside the, the, the forest, the Laotian jungles, and mm. deported back. But luckily, at the end of the second day, I, I finally met them. Mm. Yeah, no, it's absolutely, it's a fantastic documentary, and I highly recommend Thank people you. watch it. It's, um, as I said, very eye-opening for me. And I'm really curious to know uh, how much of that experience you then funneled into the, the book itself. But before we do talk about that, can you tell listeners what The Last Exile is actually about? Sure. The Last Exiles follows the journey of Jin and Suja, who are two young university students with their whole lives ahead of them. They both have promising careers ahead of them. Suja is from the upper middle class of Pyongyang in North Korea. Like a lot of people don't realize there is an upper middle class in North Korea. And so her father is an editor with the state newspaper and she has her life set. And Jin is actually from a very poor part of North Korea, a rural area that was hard hit by the famine of the 90s and has never really recovered. Like many parts of North Korea, mm. his parents were starving. He is a smart, really applied young man who ends up winning a scholarship to Pyongyang. So in some ways he embodies everybody's, every immigrant's dream, like to make something of himself. He does get to Pyongyang, like, and, but once he's there, there's a turn of events where he's trying to help his family out and he gets caught doing something and he ends up having to go to prison camp and then their lives change from that point on. Mm -hmm. So this novel follows their journey. It's one about their quest for freedom and the price of freedom, the, you know, and the cost to their relationship and the love that they share mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and what all the moral challenges they face on the road mm. to freedom. In yeah, a way, was... it's, sorry, go in, a way yeah. in a way it was partly inspired by Aranda, uh, Aravinda Diga's The White Tiger. I don't know if you read that book with 
Balram I've heard of it, name. but I haven't read it yet. Yeah, he's the main protagonist, but he's um, he goes from being a poor pauper, a young boy in India, to become an entrepreneur uh, that runs a, a business of like 50 drivers for like the whole Silicon Valley of India, basically. And uh, on his en route, he does several questionable things. Mm. He's a bit chameleonic. And so in some ways, the questions that that novel addresses is, are, is part of some something that I hope to have, hope The Last Exiles address as well. Yeah, yeah. And so with your experience of making the film, so you got to a point in the writing of the book where you really, you know, were motivated to, to make the documentary. Um, how did the actual writing of the book continue from there and how much of the, your ex own experience in that documentary making then went into the book? Mm -hmm. The spending time with North Korean defectors, both uh, undercover, but also in Canada and in the States and in Korea, helped me to get a very intimate sense of what life is like being a defector and trying to be, you know, find freedom and to establish a, a free life. And so that all went into the background, like, you know, that went all those details about people's lives, the senses, the smells on the streets of China, the memories of what it felt like to be on a train with them and to be afraid of being discovered. All that helped really um, make all the scenes come to life for me. Those, those visceral details really worked themselves into the writing of the book. And, and so I, it was invaluable. I was really grateful to have had that experience behind me to feed yeah. into how I wrote the scenes. It really becomes part of that fabric, doesn't it, of, of everything that you're pulling together. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what was your writing process like for this book, Anne? Are you somebody that sort of sits down and writes, you know, every day? Do you write when the motivation takes you? And then how did you get from that point where you had the, the first draft to then getting it into its final form? Mm. Um, I like to try and write a little bit every day, but I have a day job as a producer and director in, in documentaries and in film. And so you know, there would be weeks that sometimes went by that I couldn't, but it helped to have deadlines. And I had a, a writing buddy that I'd have to report to every Friday. So I got to my first draft um, after uh, a few years and the, the book was a lot longer than it is now. Okay. It, it yeah. had, it had a different form, you know? So I really think, I've learned that for me, the writing process is a bit like living life. You know, as, as you're growing up, you kind of accrue characteristics, you accrue worldly things and possessions and assets. And then at some point you have to kind of pare everything away and hone things down again. And that's what I had to do with this novel as well. Um, at one point it was much longer than it is. It had three main characters, in fact, four. So it was Jin and Suja, as well as Kim Jong-un and Kim Jong-il. Okay. So there were all these chapters for about Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un as well. And let me tell you, like getting into the mind of a di di dictator is actually, for a writer, it's like walking into a fun house because you're in the mind <laughs> of a character who has no boundaries, no limits. Yeah, that would be you know, true. Yeah. Unlimited wealth and no rules or regulations or laws to curtail your behavior. And so writing from that mindset was really quite interesting. It was also, of course, fed by um, a lot of background reading I'd done on Kim Jong-il and the various things his regime did and things like having um, having like a an escort cadre of women, you know, a cadre of women who were meant for his pleasure. They were actually called the equivalent of joy division, which is what the Nazis called the women that they forced into okay. becoming sex slaves, joy division. 
Um, so uh, in North Korea, they called these women uh, the joy division mm. and they were taught like entertainment arts as well as you know performance and singing as well as sexual arts the coach was sent to Poland their red light district in Warsaw to learn things to teach the girls back in North Korea. so I learned it's all this fathom, kind of, isn't it yeah just... so all this kind of stuff went into the characterization of Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un and Jin and Suja and then I, ha I handed it to an editor and an editor uh, said to me, well, you know, I think that the heart of this is really the love story between Jin and Suja. And I considered this and I was like, but look at all those brilliant chapters about Kim Jong-il <laughs> and Kim Jong-un. Please know? don't make me cut them. <laughs> exactly. But of course, after I sat with it, I realized what she said was really true. It was there was an engine, a story engine that was strong that propelled Jin and Suja's character journeys, but not as much so with Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un. So I ended up pair, like cutting down Kim Jong-il quite a bit and pairing back Kim Jong-un right quite a bit. So I killed my darlings. And they yeah, were not yeah we all have to do that. Yeah, exactly. And then um, went on to... Uh, share it again and um a different editor had said like i had them coming to canada at, uh, you know but then a different editor said you know what the plot really slows down once they arrive in canada that the momentum slows down you should consider maybe ending their journey somewhere in asia and that that i considered as well so that was interesting like trimming it those. so those various drafts and revisions took a number of years and uh, it finally saw its its way to HarperCollins. And, um, and it was actually the editor at HarperCollins who had given me that early advice about um, focusing on Jin and Suja. Okay. So mm. do the other, do Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un still have narrative parts in the story? Uh, there are... Um, there are certain, yes, Kim Jong-il and Kim Jong-un are part of the story, uh, but they're very, they're, they're smaller, much smaller. So mm -hmm. we see, um, you know, Kim, we hear about Kim Jong-il making an announcement about cr a crackdown on defectors. We see Kim Jong-un um, stepping into the role of the dictator once his father passes away. And we're in his mind, we see how he's trepidatious at first, but he starts to assume the skin of a dictator and you see that mm. process. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of fun drawing out Kim Jong-un's Kim Jong -un's character too, because he studied in Bern and lived in Switzerland. And mm -hmm. I figured he liked Cher Cherry Strusel and he <laughs> did the dam his damnedest to get to basketball games because he loves basketball. So I did a lot of that kind of writing too, which is also shelved. <laughs> yeah 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 but, so, but, but there are certain parts of his story that are in there that the, the idea being Kim Jin and Suja are the same age as Kim Jong-un okay so yeah it's comparison yeah. as to the various different worldviews and you know you mentioned having to kill those darlings but I don't think that any of that work that you do or any of that writing is ever wasted is it because it forms so much of the background and the cultural setting and the mindset of your characters Yes. Yeah. And I think it's all part of the process, isn't it? Like, it's just your way to get deeper into, into the story and to mm. really get to the uh, very convincing, authentic part of the story. I mean, how about for you? Do you have you had to kill a lot of your darlings in, in each of your books? Um, actually, the one I'm currently writing, I'm killing more darlings than I have before, because it's a story that's gotten, it's got like a double narrative, a past and present narrative, and it's sort of blown out, you know, like you were saying, of having this, this very long draft. Yes. Um, so when I've gone back, you know, and I'm starting to revise bits of it now, I'm, mm. I'm thinking, yeah, no, that's, that's interesting, uh, but it's actually not really driving the plot forward. And 
you know, I think you sound like you're a very character driven writer as well. So when it, and I'm a little bit the same. So when it gets to that whole idea of, you know, having to have the plot where people, are, you want people to keep turning the page, sometimes mm-hmm. you have to sacrifice those nice little gems that you feel really initially needed to be in there, don't you? Yes. Yeah. And I'm curious, I mean, you've written many more books than I have. And has, has it gotten... Have you gotten, has it, has that process trimmed down at all? No, no. each book is its own <laughs> beast and no, journey. I would love to say that it's gotten journey. easier, <laughs> but um, it's actually hasn't. And I guess I've just, just changed my style a little bit too over the last couple of books and I've changed the direction of my writing from, you know, we have a, a genre in Australia, which probably is Western over there, but it's sort of rural romance here. Uh, which is what I initially was writing. And I've gone more into like the women's fiction, sort of commercial fiction type genre now um, with a broader story and more about women's lives, you know. So it's got a different tone and a different style. So that becomes a whole new learning curve, you know, when you're writing a book in a different style again. Um, And, of course, all the doubts and everything that creep in, you know, that you have to deal with. Yeah, yeah, sure. But it's great you're writing women's stories. I think... Really, this we are we've entered an age for women, by women, about women, and I'm so happy to be alive today. Mm. You know, my grandmother, uh, I remember when she I remember her, you know, slapping her knee and telling me, you know, she could have been a great doctor (laughs) if only she had had the opportunity to go to university. And um, I think she could have been. Yes. And she said Mm. to me never be a nurse, be a doctor. Oh, yeah. Of course, I didn't go into the medical profession, did I? (laughs) (laughs) No, definitely not. Into the creative creative arts, but definitely, um, you know, a a different way of contributing. Yeah, for sure. So my mum is um, 97 yesterday. Oh, amazing. (gasps) Um, Yeah. And she was the same, you know, she had to leave school, even though we live in, you know, a Western country and it's, you know, it is what it is. She grew up um, a large part of her life during, you know, uh, going into the Second World War and the Depression. So she had to leave school at quite a young age, 14, and she went into becoming a tailor, tailoress. So yes, so was my grandmother, actually. Okay. Yeah, I think a lot yeah. of women did, didn't they, at that time? Yes. And, yeah. uh, you know, she was very keen for all of us to have an education as well and to, to go on and, you know, just she loves to be able to see her grandchildren pursuing their mm-hmm. careers. So it's very important in women's lives, yeah. I think. And yeah. that was something I wanted to ask you, Anne, about... Um, the that whole issue of women's lives in the book um I mean I know you have it's it is a a love story part partly um but how do you see um the story playing out as you know this around this issue of of women's lives because I know that was a big part of the documentary as well wasn't it you know Mm -hmm. that um the the situation that women even when they got to China found themselves Mm -hmm. in in the documentary Mm -hmm. and then um you know I know that a big focus for you in following the lives of the the people as they came out of China was to look at the women in the group and how it affected them so how do you see that issue um playing out and how did you then translate that to the book well I think the story of North Korean women defectors is really illuminating when you think about just refugees around the world and what happens when they're trying to travel from one country to find safe haven in a third country and they have to travel through other countries to get mm-hmm. to a place that will accept them as a refugee. With North Korean women, they, they most of them go through China. And as you know, with the one-child policy in China, their gender, their gender um, ratio was really skewed. So there was a demand for women And so most North Korean women are trafficked. They're sold either into Chinese families as brides or they're sold in they're 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 sold into brothel or escort services or internet sex. Mm -hmm. And I had met a couple women who had been sold while they were trying to escape. And so that is that is one of the themes that happens in the book because Suja ends up encountering some traffickers as she's as she's escaping, trying to find her her trying to find Jin, and so the her journey gives you a window into 
the kind of trafficking that happens in China. And what she does to try and get out of that situation is just a is just emblematic of her ingenuity and her determination and is is really reflective of the women that I met very strong determined um, and you know people who I had a lot of respect for yeah amazing you know the the two women that you focus on in the documentary is Mm -hmm. um it really blew me away of the, the strength and the courage and the you know, the heart wrench. I don't want to give too much away because I want people to watch the documentary too, but what they had to leave behind and let go of as well yes. as that, you know, that, that double-edged sword, like the joy of actually escaping and reaching yes. that goal, but then the heartbreak of, of actually yeah. having left family behind. Yeah. Mm. Uh, yes. So the two women, it's Sukja and Hijang in, uh, or Yonghee, in the defector escape mm. from North Korea, the documentary, they um, one of them had been trafficked and she had had a baby with a Chinese man. Uh, luckily, I suppose for her, the, the man had been very good to her, but she was always living under the threat of being caught and deported. And so she ended up having to leave her child with that man mm. to escape. But uh, another woman I had met, just she shows up momentarily in the documentary, was working as an escort girl in a karaoke bar. And she was continuing to do that because she was sending money back to her family in North Korea through brokers who will ferry money and cell phones and other things back and forth across the border Mm. in and out of North Korea. So a lot of North Koreans do that. And I had met a several North Korean women who were doing that. They were yeah. having to choose to stay in those circumstances because they wanted to be able to keep sending money back to their families. Yeah, yeah. And I think those that real issue of what it's like to be in that situation is so important, isn't it? And I know that you do that in both the book and the documentary, but we don't have a very good track record. I'm very sad to say here with the whole refugee issue in Australia, but um, what's it like in Canada? Because Canada is one of the places that's mentioned in the doco as, as somewhere that, mm-hmm. that people like to, um, you know, apply for, for refugee status. What What's the situation mm-hmm. currently in Canada? I'd say Canada has been receptive of refugees, but only to, you know, to limited extent. So, we are currently receiving Afghan refugees and we had been receiving Syrian refugees, but we, there was always a quota to set to it. They were also receiving North Korean refugees, um, but there's a complication with North Korean defectors. So many would find their way to like Southeast Asia and there the South Korean government would actually give them a free plane ticket to come to South Korea to repatriate in South Korea. And they would set up a welfare program to get them, you know, educated as to a capital life in a capitalist society Mm. and how to like adjust. But there was uh, prejudice against North Koreans in South Korea. So a lot of the North Korean defectors would try and get to another country again afterwards. So a lot of the defectors that were received into Canada, they were investigated and they were found to have been received by South Korea already. So those defectors were sent back to South Korea. No one was sent back to North Korea, but Mm. Canada said, you were already given a home and a place to, you know, a, a, a place in South Korean society, you did not need to come to Canada. So they turned back uh, mm. a good, uh, like including one of the people in my documentary, Mr. Okay. Saw, he had to be sent back to South Korea. Okay. Mm-hmm. Is South, so South Korea is, is fairly happy to have uh, defectors from North Korea. Is that the situation? The government is, and has been very receptive. So there's uh, like an, a reception center that's like a university campus where there's a dormitory and they're given lessons and education about how 
society works in South Korea and how they can get a job and how do you pay for housing and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, there's mixed reactions from South Korean people. There are those who are very um, generous minded and, and um, accepting of North Koreans and trying to help them. But there are others who are very uh, tired of them and prejudiced and unhappy that the government spends so much of its tax money giving these North Korean defectors stipends and places to live and such. So the society is divided. They're they're polarized about that. Okay, as often happens, doesn't it? Regardless of the country. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned to you, Anne, earlier, um, you know, this is my first experience of reading a book set uh, in this region and with characters, you know, from North Korea. So, how important do you think it is for um, us, particularly in the West, I guess, to read? Um, books and to learn about characters who do come from quite different cultural backgrounds to our own what what do you think the role of fiction is I guess in in that oh I think it's one where you can really begin to relate with this person in a way that you never could otherwise Uh, I think that's what I gained from writing this book, doing the research for it, as well as the documentary. I didn't really know much about North Korean defectors, uh, as I might not know about refugees from, let's say, uh, Syria, right? But mm. when, I, when I learned so much about their journey and who they are, what their hopes and dreams are, and how their quest for freedom is like any of our desires for what we want to achieve in our lives, I was able to really relate to them as, you know, a fellow citizen of the world who Mm. deserves just as much as I do, and who's as complex and nuanced and as smart as I am. Mm. And I think that's what's important about these kinds of stories in fiction. It's our way to really understand and embrace what we might hold as foreign or as other, you know, Mm. not my concern. Um, So that's, that's one thing that I do hope that people will gain from this book. And also why I like to read books about other countries and, and other lives and lifestyles that I don't know about. Mm. Yeah, definitely. What would you say, I mean, I think you may have touched on it there in that, in their response to that last question, but what would you say is at the heart of your writing and, and, and your, your filmmaking, I guess, as well? Um, oh, it's slightly different. So okay. it, it, with writing, it's uh, a personal, there's something, it's deeply personal as, as I'm sure, you know, you, you, you find and all all the people you've you've uh you've talked to for me it's it's deeply personal and finding the vehicle for getting that deeply personal feeling or question or you know that that whatever it is that nugget of life that i'm trying to explore Mm. that because that that finds it's its form in a story, in a narrative arc, and in characters. And so that's that's my impulse for, for writing fiction. It's a very deeply personal thing that I, I need to get out of myself. Mm. And in the process of doing it, I find what is you know universal in that impulse and hope that it speaks to the reader as well. But for documentary, I think because it's about filming people and sharing their stories, it's really about seeing what's true around me, what's happening, and to share that um, with the world. In, in some way, it, it, it's unfiltered because it's their, their story, their voices, and their images. In, in other ways, you know, I apply a certain filter in terms of how it's edited and shaped and such but with documentary I feel it's more about uh, for me it's more about um, 
a story with a kind of an, a call to action or, you know, it's more of a societal question. Whereas for me, the novel, it, it feels more intensely personal at the same time, perhaps more universal. Mm. Yeah, no, I like the, the difference between those explanations. That was great. Well, what are you currently working on, Anne? Is there another novel in the wings? Are you and you yes. are, I know, working on documentaries. So can you tell us a little bit about each of those? Sure. I'm working on a novel about uh, uh, a couple uh, that's in the slightly near future. So it's an also a, a slightly different kind of setting. And it's about uh, a challenge that they face. And you don't know whether they're going to stay together but the process in which they figure out that question is through flashbacks to different points in their lives. Uh, and I won't reveal too much about those mm. flashbacks, but it's, you know, everything from when they were born, newborn to when they're 90 years old. Wow. Um, and so that's that novel. And I'm doing, I'm executive producing a couple documentary series, including a couple about, um, I guess, I guess, uh, harassment in sports for women, one in cheerleading. And one is also a yoga organization where uh, it's a mainstream organization, but there's been some abuses of power. Okay. Very interesting. Well, def where where would people be able to find? I know I saw that that I found that doco on um, Vimeo, but where would people be able to find your work and the documentaries that you're making in Australia? Are they available internationally? Or yes, they should be. Uh, they can stream it if they look for the defector escape from North Korea. Hmm. There is uh, it's in Vimeo, but also there it's on. It's on a, a couple other platforms as well. Okay. It might be an Apple in um, iTunes in Australia, or um, it, if they do the search online, they shall find it. Uh, it might be on Google or Amazon. Um, and the book is The Last Exiles with HarperCollins, Park Row Books, and it's out in Australia this month. Exciting. Yeah. So, and it's got a gorgeous cover. I have to say, I love the oh, cover. Thank you. Yeah. Harper Collins do such a lovely job. Often I, I think, mm -hmm. you know, I love the cover of that book and it's a Harper Collins book. So um, mm -hmm. really nice to see. Oh, great. Thank you. Well, it's been lovely chatting to you, Anne, and finding out about The Last Exiles and about your other work. All the best with the new projects. And um, yeah, hopefully people are going to be able to, to read your story and to get a glimpse into some very different lives to ours. I really enjoyed this, Pamela. So great to meet you. Uh, you too. Thank you so much. Hopefully I'll see you in Toronto one day. Yes, or Sydney or close to Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> that would be lovely. Yes. Thank you. Good night.